Hi everyone, in today's video I want to talk about the concept of the disenchantment of the world, which is a concept introduced in the early 20th century by the German sociologist and philosopher Max Weber. Now, Weber introduces this concept in a lecture that he gave in 1917 at Munich University in Germany, and that speech or lecture was published two years later in 1919 as an essay. And uh, that lecture, uh, its title originally was not the disenchantment of the world. It was called the vocation of science. And so I want to talk about this article because it is a really important entry point into thinking about Weber's concept of the disenchantment of the world and of how the disenchantment of the world that he associates with scientific rationality goes hand in hand with the emergence of modernity. Now, Weber begins his lecture by talking about the vocation of the scientist, the person who dedicates their life to the pursuit of scientific research. And he takes a very concrete materialistic approach to thinking about this issue by comparing the formation, the education, and the career trajectory of scientists in the U.S. versus in Germany and thinking about how their institutional um, formation really leads them to think about themselves in a particular way and to develop a certain kind of identity. And he argues that by the time the 20th century comes around and universities are becoming increasingly professionalized and the disciplines are becoming more and more segregated into these separate departments that don't interact with one another all that much, there is a, a sense of a rising alienation among academics. And that alienation comes from the fact that universities are becoming more and more like businesses rather than academies for the cultivation of the human spirit. And so if you find yourself working, for example, in a department in a university in the U.S. or in an academic institute in a German university, those institutions need more and more money to carry out all the projects that they set out for themselves. And that means that they answer less and less to the needs of the workers, in this case, the professors or to the demands of intellectual rigor and intellectual honesty. And so there is a lot of analysis of, you know, the way in which graduate students are trained, the way in which the academic market worked already in the early 20th century, again, 1917. And all of this culminates in Weber making the argument that even though the academic system in Europe and in North America are very different, they share this sense of a rising, mounting alienation, um, even though, again, they're very different. So, for example, at some point, he says one big difference between the German um, intellectual community, especially in universities, and the American one, is that academia in Germany works according to fundamentally plutocratic principles. Because basically, the way things work in Germany is that in order to work your way up to being an academic um, uh, professor, you have to spend some time working for relatively little money supporting yourself. And that means that that career path really is only available to those individuals that are already wealthy enough to be able to afford, um, you know, a couple of years, let's say four or five years doing research without the security of a job at the end of that pathway. And so you have this plutocratic structure in Germany that he compares to what he calls a bureaucratic um, approach in the U.S., where, yes, things are more democratic and maybe there is more funding for people who want to pursue a career in the sciences, but there's a lot of bureaucratic uh, obstacles that people have to jump through that end up creating, again, that sense of alienation between the individuals who work in these institutions and the institutions themselves. Now, when Weber talks about all these institutional uh, trajectories that individuals can follow, what he's really interested in thinking about is the identity that individuals develop along the way. And he says that once individuals are in the sciences, once they find themselves um, in the profession, you, you, you know, they got their PhD, they went on the job market, and they secured a job, they find themselves in a situation where they're being evaluated according to two different sets of criteria. And this is very important. On the one hand, scientists, and by this, by the way, he means people in the natural sciences as well as the social sciences. So he'll be talking about historians, sociologists, political scientists, as much as biologists, physicists, and chemists. But he says, 
once people are in, they're going to be evaluated in two different capacities. In the capacity of research, whether or not they are producing interesting stuff that is innovative and original and shaping or contributing to an ongoing conversation. And on the other hand, they're going to be evaluated in their capacity and function as teachers. Now, the problem, according to Weber, is that these two callings, let's just call them that, uh, the calling of the researcher and of the teacher, are not the same. And the reason is because teachers succeed as teachers largely based on what he alludes to um, as the cult of personality. So often students really are drawn to teachers who are very charismatic, uh, who appeal to them according to criteria that have nothing to do necessarily with the material that they're teaching. And so people who succeed as teachers don't always succeed as, succeed as researchers and vice versa. And you can be a very original thinker, a great writer, and somehow still fail in the eyes of the university on your teaching evaluations because you're not charismatic enough and you don't satisfy whatever it is that the students are demanding um, when it comes to their um, teachers. And there is a subtext to this essay, the vocation of the science, the vocation of science, which has to do with the danger of selecting mentors, leaders for oneself, in this case, in the context of the university, merely on that cult of personality, which produces demagogues. And so I want you to think about that as being in the background, because that will shape the analysis that Weber gives us in this piece. Now, what is the problem with this cult of personality and with the split between the research and the teaching identities of academics? Now, Weber points out that even though current institutional realities in academia on both sides of the Atlantic make it such that academics feel this pressure to develop a cult of personality, personality by itself cannot be the, the sole answer to the problem of success in the sciences. In order for somebody to become a successful scientist, now in a more global sense, encompassing research and teaching together, they need two other things that are fundamental, according to him. And those are passion and inspiration. Of course, as a scientist, you need passion for your research subject matter um, in order for you to be motivated to continue to do research, even when you are maybe only chipping away at a very specific um, niche topic that not a lot of people in the world care about. And I think this is something that a lot of scientists can relate to, that they develop a fascination, an obsession, a passion with something, and that's what keeps them in the profession. Um, as one professor once told me, if you're in academia for the fame and fortune, you went into the wrong uh, field of work. So it's that passion that keeps a lot of academics in their line of work. The second thing that you also need is inspiration because you need to be able to contribute something to our collective understanding of that phenomenon in order for you to feel like you are part of the scientific community, right? Somebody who is just passionate about science but doesn't contribute, doesn't discover, doesn't innovate, we would say maybe they are a science teacher, but not necessarily a scientist. A scientist needs to be productive, and that means that they need to be inspired. Now, these two concepts of passion and inspiration, Weber says, bring the concept of, bring the figure of the scientist a lot closer to the figure of artist than maybe we would have ever thought about. because. If you think of the scientist as somebody that succeeds on the basis of passion and inspiration, it's very difficult to understand how that differs from the artist who also succeeds in his or her domain on account of passion and inspiration, right? When we think about artists, we think about individuals who become, again, obsessed with an idea, they pursue it, and they get some form of inspiration, whatever your theory of inspiration might be, and produce something new. An original shakes up the world of art. And so the scientist and the artist are closer to each other than maybe we realize. Where they differ, um, Weber says, is in that they have a very different relationship to the concept of progress. In science, advancement happens by an incremental growth where things build upon one another in a rational and coherent way. Uh, and that's just not the case in 
in the world of art, right? In the world of art, it would be very weird to say that a movement of art, let's just say um, neo-impressionism, is more true than the movement that preceded it, namely impressionism, right? Truth and progress don't seem to be the right categories for thinking about the evolution and the trajectory of art. But in science, you do need that concept of progress. You do need to be able to say that what comes later is on rational grounds better than what came before. And so the scientist must be committed to a concept of progress that the artist does not need um, in his or her line of work. Now, this is where the essay turns in a slightly existential direction. And why is that? The reason for that is because Weber very astutely points out that once you introduce the notion of progress, which is infinite, right? You can always improve your knowledge with new and new discoveries. It's not as if at some point in time, science will come to an end and we will have completed science. Rather, it's an infinite task. Once you introduce that element into the equation, it prompts a bit of an existential crisis in those who devote their life to the pursuit of knowledge. And essentially, it puts the scientist in a pickle because you have to accept that you are fully passionate about something that will eventually become obsolete. So there's a sense of futility that gets latched onto the figure of the scientist because you know deep down as a scientist that even if you have the greatest discovery in a hundred years, the chances that that discovery will still stand in a thousand years are pretty close to zero percent. And so this raises a question, which is why does anybody do science when they know deep down that the obsolescence of their own way of thinking, of their own contributions, of their own possible discoveries is kind of already built into the activity itself. And this is where Weber shifts in the article from thinking about the vocation of the scientist, the individual, to the vocation of science, the social practice. And so we need to say more about that. It is in the second half of the lecture that Weber turns to this vocation of science writ large and introduces his very famous concept of the disenchantment of the world. Now, the German is Entzauberung, which is translated as disenchantment, but can also be translated in a slightly different way, um, which is the demagification. I don't know if I'm saying that right, or the, the, the taking away of the magic uh, of the world. Uh, and in German, that root uh, has to do with the breaking of an enchantment or the breaking of a spell. And in short, it means that in the early 20th century, you know, following the Industrial Revolution, we live in a world where science has become so successful in explaining pretty much everything about the world that the world has lost its spark. And one way to think about why the world has lost its spark is in terms of the difference between what is unknown and what is unknowable from the standpoint of individuals. So, for example, in my case, I know that there are a lot of things out there that I just don't know. They are unknown to me because I haven't studied them, I haven't researched them, and I haven't taken the time to look into it. For example, I, I don't really know the temperature of the sun. I don't know um, the size of the average bacterium. I don't know how many polar bears remain in existence. But that doesn't mean that that knowledge is inaccessible to me in principle. In fact, it's unknown, but it is not unknowable. And it, the reason, again, for that has to do with the success of science. All, all I have to do in order to find the answers nowadays is Google it. He's writing in the 1910s, so a slightly different technological context. But all I have to do is research it. The answer is out there, kind of like the X-Files. Um, what is it? The truth is out there. That's his view about the modern world, that the modern world has become disenchanted with itself because there is no longer any sense of mystery. Every question that you could possibly ask about nature, there is an answer that science can furnish. Now, science achieved this high level of success, this really kind of total uh, explain this total power of explanation, according to Weber, by mixing two 
important innovations. The first one is what Weber calls concepts. So science succeeds at explaining the world by introducing new concepts and then testing them in a variety of ways. And he says, when you think about the conceptuality of science, that's something that science really owes to the Greeks, who in their philosophy really valued um, the creation of new concepts. And so that's the first tool that science uses, that science uses for, for mastering nature, concepts. The second thing that science uses for mastering nature is experiments. Um, and that's something that science owes to the Renaissance. It is during the Renaissance on the eve of the scientific revolution that suddenly individuals really turn to experience as the ultimate ground for the justifiability of our claims. You want to claim something? Show me how you got that from experience. Um, and, and from experience here means not just from lived experience, but from controlling experience, which is what experiments do. Now, for a very long time, since the 17th century, and this is where now the history of modern science kicks in, people have understood that this scientific combination of concepts and experiments has been extremely valuable for human life. So if you look at the Renaissance, if you look at the early modern period, if you look at the 18th and 19th centuries, people were committed to the idea that science adds something of value, something of meaning to human existence. But we no longer believe that anymore. Um, and this is where, according to Weber, the disenchantment of the world emerges. And he explains this in entirely generational language, which was somewhat surprising to me. He says, you know, like back in the day, older generations believed in the value and the vocation of science, that science had a mission that was meaningful. But nowadays, young people don't believe that anymore. And that means that people simply give over themselves to science, but they think about science simply as a practical activity that only serves instrumental ends and allows you to dominate nature, but doesn't do any other kind of spiritual work to enhance our experience of reality. So if you talk to the average person in the 20th century and you ask them, you know, what is science good for? Well, it will give you technology. It will allow you to control nature and to predict maybe certain causes on certain effects on the basis of certain causes. That's it. It's all instrumental. It's all means ends rationality. And that means, according to Weber, that we have lost that older sense that he says was there in the Renaissance. It was there even, he says, with Protestantism, that science in some way adds or injects some kind of spiritual value into human life. We've lost that. Now, one of the most interesting things that I discovered while reading this lecture is that when Weber talks about the disenchantment of the world, he is definitely thinking about something that science has brought about. So again, science has become so powerful, it can explain everything that as a result, it takes the mystery, the spark out of the world. And that's where he says practical rationality has become science's only identity. It is the only way in which we experience science. We see science as, um, he says, it's rigid, it's cold, it's unethical. Um, not unethical in the sense that it's actively unethical, but th that it has no ethics. It just controls things in a very pragmatic way. But the disenchantment of the world for Weber is not just something that science has produced by taking out the spark out of nature. It's something that we also have produced by not understanding the real meaning, the real vocation of science. And so this is what surprised me in reading this essay for the first time, is that I've always thought of the disenchantment of science as a problem that Weber identifies and imputes to scientific rationality. But in fact, he says, the problem is not that science di disenchanted us, but that we have disenchanted ourselves with science. We no longer believe in science. And so the final part of the lecture talks about the very different kinds of value that, according to Weber, we need to realize science provides to human life.
And he identifies four kinds of value that science adds to human existence. The first one is definitely technical prowess. And that's what he already identified as practical rationality, means, and rationality. Yes, science gives you technology. Science gives you cures for a lot of diseases. It gives you buildings. It gives you engineering, so on and so forth. But that's not it. The second value that science gives us is that it gives us a method of thinking and it trains us in that method of thinking. And that method of thinking is fundamentally critical. When you're a scientist, you look at established tradition and you question it. You say, is this true by virtue of, again, the concepts that I use and the experience that I can either have or generate? Now, the third value that we get from science is what Weber just calls clarity. If you accept a certain set of values in your personal life, let's say that I become a communist or let's say that I become a Republican, scientific thinking, that kind of critical spirit, teaches me that if I accept certain values, then I also accept, logically speaking, the means necessary to instantiate those values. And so by giving me that ability to logically reflect upon the relationship between my values and the means that are necessary to, to generate them, it means that it gives clarity to my worldview and to my priorities. So it allows me to reorganize my thinking, my, the, my web of knowledge by thinking, well, if I don't want to accept those means to get that goal, it means that I don't really accept that goal in the first place. And so I have to rethink my answer when somebody asks me what values I ultimately cherish. Now, the fourth and final value that I want to talk about in connection to, to this is that science also tells you the meaning of a practical stance from a particular ideological position. So what is your ideology? Once you know what your ideology is, what, what kind, I'm using the term here, ideology, in a very, very loose sense, and so does Weber. Once you know what kind of practical stance you have toward the world, then you can try to figure out by thinking scientifically about it what the meaning of that stance is in practical terms. So in a way, science forces you to really confront yourself and say, if I am X, if I identify as X, whatever X might mean, let's say that I believe in a particular practical stance, like I believe in being a revolutionary, the meaning of that stance is going to be determined by my other set of ideological beliefs. So for example, if I have certain conservative leanings, that will determine the meaning of my pro-revolutionary stance. Whereas if I have left-leaning political values, that means that my pro-revolutionary practical stance has a very different meaning, even if the stance is the same. And so again, the way in which Weber explains this last point, which I think is really, really interesting, is that it forces you at the individual level to give an account of who you are, what you value, and what your practical stances mean in light of the whole constellation of values that you claim to embrace. And so science is never going to give you your values, but it will give you a way of thinking about and um, deliberating about those values. The way to think about all of this at the end of the lecture is that science maybe has disenchanted nature, but it can still do a little bit of what Weber himself calls ethical work. It can help us do that kind of thinking and clarity and reflecting on values, even if it can never give us our values directly. Our values have to come from somewhere else. And so the point to close on here is that the disenchantment of the world for Weber is both something that science has produced through its very success, but also it seems something that science can help us overcome as long as we move away from the cynical interpretation of science that we have developed in the last 150 years.